Here we go. Well, good morning. I feel honored to be at this esteemed gathering to learn about all the many broad JWSP results. And I thank Yveen and the PAS for inviting me. So yesterday we uh, learned about exoplanets, uh, which really are a byproduct of star formation. And we learned about high Z galaxies, <clears throat> which are at low metallicity. So today I'm going to talk about star formation at low metallicity, which is relevant to both topics. So why study extragalactic star formation at low metallicity? Um, well, most of what we understand about star formation, the detailed physics comes from nearby star formation regions like Ryan Taurus of Eucus. But at the peak epoch of star formation in the universe, the metallicity was much lower. It's more like 20% solar. Um, and so the question is, are the physics different? when you go to metallicity compared to what we know from the galaxy. And so the study spans a range of metallicities from the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is 50% solar. And here it's 0.5 Z. So Z represents all the metals. So everything heavier than hydrogen and helium, what is that fraction of metals compared to the sun? So in units of the sun, so half the solar. Um, and then as you go to the right, you're decreasing through the sample to the lowest metallicity, which is one Zwicky 18, which is about 3% the metallicity of the sun. Now, the other advantage of doing extragalactic star formation is you know the distance, um, and hence you know the luminosities, and you can really specify uh, what the masses and constituents are. Um, and then also, because they're kind of just far enough away, you know, with the JWST imaging, you can get lots of statistics. So in one image of near camp, you get hundreds or thousands of sources. Um, so it's very efficient. And really what we're doing is studying star formation in sort of a stellar population mode. So you can get statistics. And JWC has really opened up the door um, to studying this type of star formation for the first time because of its um, really good image quality and also its sensitivity. So, uh, and then of course you can combine it with other observatories like ALMA and HST and you can do what I call Milky Way type star formation studies nearby for the first time. Um, so how we approach this is we search for YSOs, which is uh, an acronym for young stellar objects, which are stars in the process of formation. And they're char characterized by multiple stages. And so on the right, uh, you see sort of the conceptual physics of what's happening. The gas and dust coalesce to form a core onto which uh, mass continues to accrete. Conservation of angular momentum causes a disk to form at the center. You're still accreting while also ejecting and often see bipolar jets from these things. Um, the envelope eventually dissipates and you're left with a very heavy disk. Um, and then finally the disk starts to dissipate because planets are forming and, uh, and things are, are becoming ejected. Now at each of these stages, the starlight is re-radiated by the circumstellar envelopes and accretion occurring, and you see this at the infrared wavelength. Um, and then on the right, so in the middle, you'll see spectral energy distributions because each stage is sort of, has a distinctive spectral energy distribution or SED. And James Webb is excellent at um, characterizing the SEDs of sort of these class three or class two, class one objects because the photometry of near cam in um, MIRI combined really sample it quite well. So, so let's start nearby. We're going to start with an intensive star formation region. Um, one of the other aspects of high Z or peak star formation is not only was the metallicity lower, but it was actually much more intensive, uh, forming perhaps superstar clusters, which may be today's globular clusters. Um, so we uh, start off with N79, which is host to an embedded superstar cluster candidate, H72.97-6939. This was found to be the most luminous infrared source in the Large Magellanic Cloud as found in the Spitzer and Herschel surveys. And the mirror image off to the left shows that as you go to the longer wavelengths, which is red, we learned this from Klaus yesterday, red is longer, um, you, you see the star, uh, the embedded star sort of peering out. Uh, so what we've done is <clears throat> done an analysis 
uh, with the MIRI photometry and SED fitting to derive masses for 106 young stellar objects in the region. Um, and what we show in the color codes here are the different masses um, of objects that, that were characterized. And you can see in pink, um, those are the most massive sources, sources, more than eight solar masses. And a lot of them are close to that superstar cluster location. Uh, now we also did MIRI MRS spectroscopy of sort of three sources in the whole N79 region and one focused on the superstar cluster candidate. Um, and what we found is the Spitzer IR spectra, which was taken um, over a decade ago, is at the bottom and it breaks up into five sources. Um, and each of them, uh, we actually had to use the MIRI spectroscopy to derive the photometry for these because it saturates in the MIRI image. Um, but you can uh, characterize, you can see the range of masses of these things are 27 to 40 solar masses, all located within uh, the center of the superstar cluster. Now I'm just gonna expand on YSO4, which is the bottom one, and that you can see dominates the IRS spectrum. It's the most luminous. And off to the right, you can see the richness of the MIRI spectrum uh, from the source uh, that was published uh, about to come out in print um, by NIAC. Now, uh, what you see here in the middle, sorry, the second from the top is you see this broad dip. This is the silicate absorption feature. This is characteristics of very deeply embedded young stellar objects. And then you see the plethora of lines that can be used to diagnose the neutral gas, H1, molecular hydrogen, and the ionized gas, argon-3, neon-2, sulfur-3, iron-2. And then you also see that nitrogen line is actually a little absorption dip. You see absorption dips from some of these uh, molecular species and ices. Moving on to the small Magellanic Cloud, NGC 346. On the left is uh, the near cam, beautiful near cam image of this source. Um, and in the near cam image, we discovered thousands of low mass young stellar objects for the first time. And again, this is because of Jada's T's. Uh, sensitivity, um, and of course the angular resolution, you can separate uh, these small faint objects from, from the more massive bright regions. You can see on the right where the YSO populations um, reside, and you can see the wispy clouds um, that are per particularly um, captured by the pH feature at the 335 um, band. Um, just follow along those molecular features as you might expect. Now, the way we characterize on a mass population for these sources is we use color, color, and color magnitude diagrams. With NIRCAM, we use um, sort of a redder cutter color on the, the left axis and um, a bluer color, if you will, on the right. All the sources from the region, and there's I don't know, like 200,000 of them or something, um, are in black. And then the sort of nearby stars, upper main sequence or UMS, RGB, red clump, these are stars that don't have dust around them. So we're not so interested in, but we have to know where they're located. Um, the pre-main sequence stars, which are kind of the class three, um, have excess in the passion alpha, which is traced by this F187, a nitrogen feature. So you see accretion, this uh, evidence of accretion, uh, and that's what separates them from ordinary main sequence stars. And then on the top right, you have the young stellar object. Um, and those are embedded. And so some of the um, extrapolation to the right is because they're embedded, but also we expect accretion to be occurring in these things. So the passion alpha also gives us a measurement of the accretion. Um, now, this is just another view of the data where you're looking at color magnitude uh, diagram. So on the left is basically the luminosity. As you go higher, uh, you're at brighter objects. Um, and then the color as you go to the right, things are redder or more embedded. Um, again, you can see the plethora of ordinary stars, um, but then the things that we're interested in are the redder and fainter populations, the cyan and the blue. So this is how we identify sources and then we, and then we model them. Now, as you go to the MIRI, longer wavelength bands, the young stellar object population becomes prominent and even dominant in terms of the constituency. So MIRI is critical for identifying and really characterizing 
what a young stellar object is. And here is uh, the MIRI image. This is a combination of near CAM, the longest wave like near CAM and blue. Uh, the 77 again is the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon feature. So it's tracing sort of the, the edges of the molecular gas. And then in red is the uh, 2100. And this is sort of the hot or warm dust near the hot stars. And also they pick the embedded object. So using MIRI, we find 833 candidate YSOs many of which have been flagged, um, and again, along, along those bands. And this is just two examples, uh, objects where we get total spectral energy distribution. So you basically have a class one on the left and a class two on the right. Now, moving on to NGC 6822, 20% solar. This is further away. We capture more of the galaxy. Prior Spitzer observations show number of young stellar objects in these in these regions. What we did is we sampled the center, so we can also study the largest number of stellar populations. Here you can see all the stars, <laughs> and the near cam image is basically a star field. Um, where is Spitzer 1? Well, if you look in MIRI, you up pop all the diffuse emission plus the embedded sources. And so this study really focused and required the MIRI data to even find the young stellar objects on the left. Again, the color magnitude diagram on the right, the locations of these. Uh, we find 130 YSOs um, in the region, which are slightly slower, lower mass um, than the ones estimated with Spitzer because they broke up. All right, lastly, one's Wiki 18. It's a dwarf, extremely poor, metal poor galaxy. It's sort of the poster child where everyone looks for low metallicity. It's much further away, but it has active star formation. Um, this is what the MIRI image looks like. And you can see all the point sources in here. This is what we had with Spitzer, kind of barely resolved the object. And hence, for the very first time, we can study the dusty stellar populations of this extremely metal poor galaxy. On the left is the upper main sequence. Um, and on the right are sort of the redder asymptotic giant branch stars, most likely carbon rich. We used the longer wavelength near CAM to identify things in green, which have sort of more dust associated with them. Um, and then this is where these two kind of populations go. On the left are younger populations that are more prominent. Um, here, I just want to point out that the orientation is different uh, because uh, the other one was sort of native of the figure. But to the right uh, top is a Northwest. And that's sort of younger populations, perhaps with for a lot of recent star formation and the older population on the right. Um, now, the MIRI photometry is lagging a bit. Um, uh, and we hope to, with the MIRI photometry, really pull out the young stellar object. All right, so just in summary, I'll leave this up here. Um, I, I just want to mention that the reason we can do this work is because James Webb goes up to seven magnitudes deeper than prior surveys. Um, and most of the image I show you, um, the, the single image, it took like an hour or two to, to take this data. Super efficient, huge impact in terms of these statistics. So I'll stop there and take questions.